Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. I welcome you to our matin service for this second Sunday of the Easter season as we continue to rejoice in the good news of our Lord's triumph over sin in the grave. For those of you joining us online, again, if you want to uh, get a copy of the bulletin, go to mountcalvarypeoria.org, look under the media section, and you'll find where you can download that bulletin to follow along with this service. For the rest of you all, again, I remind you, please take time to fill out one of the registration cards and drop them off in the offering plate as you depart. We appreciate your help with that. Now, everyone, wave at one another. There we go. You are passing the peace. All right. And with that said, we begin with our opening hymn, Awake My Heart with Gladness.
I invite you to stand for the order of confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I invite you to examine your conscience now in silence before the Lord according to his word and your station in life. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Oh, come, let us worship him. You may be seated. We join together in the responsive singing of Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters of the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all depths. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy and falling into earth. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men and beings together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And we continue with the office hymn. First reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, the fourth chapter. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Here ends the reading. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. 
Second reading is from the first letter of John, the first and second chapter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here ends the reading. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the gospel verse. Alleluia. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, is recorded in the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the honor due his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give to him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory be to the Father and to the Son 
and to the Holy Spirit. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give to the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. And you may be seated for the hymn. And so I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, from our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So, just in case John had not made the point clearly enough, let me reiterate, to believe that Jesus is the Christ is to believe that he is raised. And to believe that he is raised is to believe that he is the Son of God, and to believe that he is the Son of God is to share his life, to have life in his name. And yet you may have noticed that it didn't run quite as smoothly as that on that first Easter. It didn't work, it didn't run smoothly, because of fear, didn't run smoothly because of unbelief. And those are two issues that you and I still struggle with in this fallen world, even with Jesus gloriously raised. So let's start where we had ended last week, also in John chapter 20, with Mary Magdalene reporting to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she also shared with them that Jesus said he was ascending to his God and their God to his Father and their Father. Now, You'd think, having heard this report, the first thing that everyone would have wanted to do is go out and find Jesus. He was alive. He's walking around. He's there to be seen, to be touched, to be listened to. But that didn't happen. The disciples stayed where they were. They were afraid. 
The news of the empty tomb didn't alleviate their fears, it only intensified them. John tells us that the disciples were afraid of those authorities, those opponents of Jesus who had engineered his death some two days earlier. Likely they thought something like, you know, once they find out that Jesus' body is missing, they're going to come looking for us and blame us and throw us in jail and maybe kill us too. It's best to lay low, stay out of the public eye. Now we might say, well, look, with Jesus alive, with sin and death undone, shouldn't fear just evaporate? After all, what can earthly powers do to harm those who belong to Christ? And yet that's not what the disciples were thinking, at least not yet. And of course, the same challenge can be put to us, right? I mean, this last year, if anything, has been a primer in fear. Right? More than a few believers have found themselves behind locked doors, both physically and metaphorically. Obviously, there's the virus out there. There have been the racial tensions, the social unrest that has been unleashed by a series of well-publicized issues of police brutality towards brown and black people. There's been political turmoil. Capital being attacked by a mob. Many feel like the world is coming apart at the seams, and in fear, they, they stay in the shadows. They, they keep their heads down. They're worried about what's going to happen next. They don't want to speak their mind for fear that they're going to get caught in the crossfire. Fear robs us of joy. It robs us of compassion. It robs us of faith. And when we get sucked into the world's obsession with self-preservation, we forget where our true hope lies. And now this is not to say that we throw all reasonable caution to the wind. It's not to say that we abandon our love of neighbor to go ahead and assert our own rights and freedoms, but it is a reminder that fear cuts us off from the gifts that Christ has for us. Anyway, Mary delivered the news to the disciples, but fear kept them locked up in that room behind the doors. And Jesus came to them anyway. Now that's good news, right? Jesus comes to us in spite of our fear, in spite of our sin. In fact, the risen Lord comes to us precisely because of sin and fear. Right? In sin and fear, we can't go to him. He has to come to us. Now, of course, when the disciples first saw them, joy was not the first thing that welled up in them. They knew that they had abandoned Jesus a few days earlier, that over the past days they had proven faithless in a variety of ways, not least of which going to the tomb that morning with the spices as if they were going to continue to anoint his dead body. With Jesus alive and in their midst, they feared judgment was coming. But no, Jesus showed them his hands and he showed them his side. And he wasn't doing that to say, look what you all did to me. Jesus was rather saying, see, look what I have done for you. I willingly went to death and suffered so that you would be free from death and judgment and condemnation. I did this for you in love. You need not fear judgment. And then, right, the disciples were glad. Then came the relief. Then came the joy. And Jesus reiterated to them, peace be with you. So fear is one struggle. And keep us from living fully in the light of the resurrection. But it's not the only one. For some reason, Thomas wasn't with the others when Jesus came to them. So unbound from here, fear, you'll notice that they went out from their locked room. They found Thomas, and they gave him the same report that Mary had given them, but this time plural rather than singular. We have seen the Lord. And it wasn't fear that kept Thomas from receiving that news, but unbelief, skepticism. The demand that certain conditions be satisfied before he would put his trust in such a claim. Now, you need to understand, Thomas had been with these people for the last three years. He knew their character. He knew that they wouldn't lie about such a thing. But that didn't matter. Until circumstances agreed with Thomas' way of thinking, he was going to continue living without a risen Lord. And of course, you and I, we do that too, right? We put conditions on what we will or we won't do, on what we will or we won't believe, right? You know, I'll help so-and-so when they help me. I'll forgive that person when she says she's sorry. I'll go ahead and change this sinful behavior once God strengthens me to resist temptation. I'll go to church more often once it gets more interesting. Right? The list can go on and on here. 
In Thomas's case, he wanted to touch Jesus to satisfy his need, to make sure that someone wasn't trying to pull something over on him. Skepticism is an easy excuse to get out of having to change your life, right? Can I really trust so-and-so? Do I really know that that's true? I am, you, know, you need to look before you leap, right? How can I know it's really reliable? And just as Jesus did not let the disciples' fear keep him away, Jesus did not let Thomas's unbelief stand in his way. He came to Thomas and commanded him, go ahead, put your finger here, put your hand here. Do not be unbelieving. Believe. Trust. Live in the light of my triumph over death. And Thomas became then the first in faith to say to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus overcame fear, overcame skepticism by coming to those who did not initially receive the news of his resurrection with faith and joy. But what about us? I mean, we might not have Mary or the disciples personally telling us, we have seen the Lord, but we do have the scriptures. And John tells us that these are written so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, risen and living, and that you may have life in his name. And yet, part of us at least says, yeah, well, it's easy to say that, but they had the resurrected Lord come to them personally. All we have is others telling us about stuff. Of course, that's not quite right, is it? Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. In other words, as we gather as church, as we gather as the body of Christ, Jesus is in our midst, just as he was with the disciples the evening of that first Easter. But here, the inner skeptic objects, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, we can't see him. We can't touch him the way they did. We can't hear him. It's not the same. Well, this, frankly, is where we have to tell our inner skeptic to sh shut up and sit down. For where Jesus is, there his spirit is, and that spirit is ever seeking to move hearts to faith. So stop fighting it. We see Jesus in his church. We hear Jesus in his word being read and preached. We touch Jesus in the waters of holy baptism. Or when we go to the altar for the sacrament of his body and blood. Jesus comes to us here and now to be near to us. One person commented that until he started going to a Lutheran Christian church, he had spent years trying to get close to God and found himself failing time and time again. But then he heard the good news that Jesus comes near to us, here in word and sacrament. Regardless of how we may feel, regardless of what we may be thinking, Jesus comes near to us and gives us his grace and his love and his mercy. And this person said, then my life was changed, and at last I was at peace. Jesus comes to us, and he still says to us, peace be with you. And you know that in the Bible, peace isn't about the absence of strife or trouble. Peace, shalom, right? It's about living in harmony with God's way and God's will. Because Jesus lives, because death and judgment are taken away, because fear and skepticism are put away, we have peace with God and with one another, and we can start living in peace as we treat each other with the justice and the decency that God calls us to. What can others do to us? Christ lives. Let others go ahead and mistreat us. Let them take advantage of our peace, our gentleness. What of it? Jesus says, peace be with you. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the giving of the Holy Spirit here is not about giving you powers that are not known to mere mortals, but it is about more than just helping you believe that there's a God or that Jesus is raised. Jesus, risen and living, gives you his spirit so that you can have his faith, his trust, his reliance in the Father working in you. It is so that you can look to the Father with confidence and trust that all will be well. It's so that you can say to the Father with complete peace and hope and joy into your hands, I commend my spirit. And of course, when the spirit works faith in you, not only do you have peace, but you find that you're completely ready and eager to go ahead and walk in right pathways. You want to live in justice. You want to show mercy and grace with all others around you.
And finally, Jesus, risen in our midst, says to us, as the Father sent me, I am sending you, forgive the sins of others, and they are forgiven them. We, the church, as Christ's body, carry on his work. Because he is with us, we declare his forgiveness to those who repent, even as we give forgiveness to others within the spheres of our personal lives. And we ask for forgiveness when that's needed as well. This is what it means to have life in Jesus' name. It is to be sent out into the world as his emissaries, as carriers of his light and life. It is to be at peace. It is to have his spirit. It is to forgive and show mercy. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. And now may that peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the glorious day of his appearing. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together singing the Te Deum. We praise you, O God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may, by your grace, confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, your mercies are new to us every morning, and you abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Give us, we humbly pray, your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and cheerfully serve you. Amen. Almighty God, Give us grace to trust you during this time of illness and distress. In mercy, put an end to the epidemic that afflicts us. Grant relief to those who suffer and comfort all that mourn. Sustain all medical personnel in their labors and cause your people ever to serve you in righteousness and holiness. Amen. And here is as we bring our concerns to you in our hearts. Grant health and healing to Lavelle Borders, Jackie Pendarvis, Joe Leon, Karen Manthe, and Mary Dowds. Give continued healing to Sophia Maxwell, Ardeen Ruckel, Miguel Bulwer, Teresa Johnston, Joan Ross, Elizabeth Whitfield, Dominic Moretti, Amanda Carpenter, Bill Barr, Richard Coltrin, Luke Horst, Penelope Lampton, Carol Hoffman, Jim Casper, Carol Lockridge, Joy Wessler, Penny Voss, Ms. Ritter, Gary Ruckel, Natalie Felice, and Cheryl. Give relief to Mark Manthe, give healing to Harry Coy, Brian Kelly, Michael Wilson, Virginia David Shirley, and Deaconess Jillian. Grant recovery to Graylin and Mark, grant health and strength to Sally Taylor, Ann Bulwer, Marjorie Ruskuski, Earl Boyette, Valerie, Chris, Patty, Jim, and Gary. Continue to heal Dave, Lori, Joan, Dale, and Richard. Give continued strength to Jan and Sally. We also ask you to watch over TJ, Maureen and her children, Janessa Lampton and the child she carries, Cheryl Rebel, Gloria, Jameson, Richard, Sally, Stephen, Adriana. Bless and keep Susie Fink, Jenny Bradley, Pat Getz, Theo Norman, Rebecca, Lois, Tanisha, Jenny, John, Laurel, Constance, Linda, Carl, Kenneth, and Lori. Grant them all wellness. Speed healing for Pam and Dolores. Bless the Tompkins family and Clara. Grant grace to Jackie and her family. Give relief to Kathy and Lil, grant strength and healing to Josh, Bill, Bray, Lynn, and Gabby. Give health to Gordon, Jim, Lloyd, and Elwin. Be with all travelers to give them safe journeys. Also watch over Shirley, Max, Miracle, Neil, Shane, Faith, Jenna, Steve, Eric, Gloria, Sandra, and Phyllis. Give grace and healing to Christiane, Ruth, and Phyllis. Be with Luann and Shelby Cooper and Yasmin, uphold Rick. Give healing to Gary, strengthen Sharon and Kathy. Be with Pastor Drews, Valerie Connor, Joella Michael, Teresa Carrick, Tanya Speed, Deb Alleg, Marsha, Delcy Lane, Becky Richards, Dave, Mark Dickman, Olivia Bradley, Sharon Rumbold, Sherry Emberton, Ron Millard, Sandra, Larry, Rod, Pastor Center, Ginny, David Shannon, Rudy Ward, Michael Dale, Kathy Gordon, Maureen, Pastor Neiman, Mary, Ethan, and Gail, and Jonathan, to give them all healing and strength according to your will. Support all those recovering from disasters of various sorts and be with those who are working to bring relief in every place where they are needed. We pray that you bring peace and justice to the nations and keep the scourge of war far off. We pray that you heal the divisions that bring bitterness to our nation. We implore your grace to bring an end to all ethnic and racial bigotry and to grant understanding, grace, and equity to all. We lift up all who have suffered violent attack this last week, especially victims of recent shootings, praying that you grant mercy, healing, faith, and justice, O Lord. Bring us peace. Watch over Pastor Hake and his family. Bless their service. Bless the ministry of Concordia Lutheran School and be with all students and educators everywhere to keep them in health. Give grace and support to all learning situations. 
be with our Senate and all its officers, Matthew, our synodical president, Mark, our district president, and all Senate and district officials, that they may be guided by your word to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Grant stability, faith, and hope to all who are struggling in this economy. Bless the people of Haiti as they struggle to recover and establish a stable civil life. Grant shelter and protection to all refugees, especially those displaced by the conflict in Syria. Finally, we ask you to send your spirit of peace to Somalia, Myanmar, the Ukraine, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Middle East, especially Gaza, Iraq, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen, and all places torn by war or civil strife. O oh Lord, in your mercy, we also ask that while our nation continues to live with peril, while many remain in harm's way, that you would watch over us, show your mercy to all who are in danger or who suffer in any way, comfort those who mourn, heal those who are injured, give wisdom and humility to those in authority. Continue to be with Derek Foote, Joshua Zook, Alex Zook, and all deployed and active duty military personnel and their families. Protect all innocent civilians, bring the wicked to justice, defend the righteous, and lead all to repent of evil and seek your peace. We know that all things are in your hands, Father, and we ask that you would bring justice and establish fair government according to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We join in the closing hymn.
The service has ended. Go in peace. Christ is risen.